All right, so let me start. This is the name of one of my childhood heroes. And for those of you who don't rec recognize him, this is a full name. And MacGyver is the main character of an 80s TV show around a secret agent working for the Phoenix Foundation. And he had this speciality. He would come up with all sorts of crazy inventions to get out of tricky situations. And he would do so by combining the tools he had around him, maybe in a way they weren't intended to be used. So let me share with you today how we at Zing had a couple of those MacGyver moments when we started to implement our way to let our product teams contribute to the schema. So hi, I'm David. Um, I work as a software engineer at Xing. And for those of you who don't know it, it's the green LinkedIn, so LinkedIn for the German-speaking market. And specifically, I'm working on the IPA team. And the IPA team's responsibility is provide access to the data that we have on the platform. And traditionally, that meant, like in many companies, access through RESTful APIs. In 2017, however, this changed dramatically when we started our exciting GraphQL journey with the Xing One project. And the Xing One project aimed to build what is probably the sweet spot of GraphQL infrastructure these days, and we heard a lot about that today, which is a gateway in front of our existing REST APIs, right? Uh, so that our products could benefit from what we are providing via GraphQL, while we could still use our existing REST APIs to fetch the actual data. And while implementing the piece of infrastructure in and of itself and making it performant, reliable, and robust was a challenging and is still a challenging uh, topic and probably worth its own talk, I want to, talk, uh, I want to um, focus on another part of the project, which is how do we come up with a strategy that allows our product teams to reap the benefits of what GraphQL provides, right? So how do we enable adoption of the technology we wanted to bring into the company in the concept or in the context of a greater company like Sing? So we identified a couple of success factors that had to be met, in our opinion, for, uh, for making it feasible. And these are the, the majority uh, of points that I want to stress here is that it had to provide fast feedback. So you don't want to find out late that you're going in the wrong direction. So in your development workflow, you want to know if you're going in the right way or in the wrong way. It should have a reasonably shallow learning curve, because we as software developers, we have to learn a lot of things, and uh, the less complex the new things are that we have to learn, the better, because we have to kind of pick it up on the side. And it should certainly have high utility so that we have confidence that whatever our products need could be expressed here. And lastly, it should be easy to teach, because we as a team also task ourselves with teaching what we wanted to provide to the rest of the company. So we built our service in Scala, and the great Sangria framework, which I can't stress enough, how awesome uh, kind of software that is. Um, so naturally, our first approach to it was to have our engineers write Scala. And we are mostly a Ruby shop, so that meant they had to learn it. And if you think about Scala, I don't know if you know it, but with regards to these success factors, it doesn't fare so well, right? So the feedback cycle is rather long if you like, have a rather huge code base. Now, the learning curve is certainly not shallow. It's a rather complex language to start with, even if you constrain yourself to the APIs that you really need to know in order to contribute to our uh, service. OK, high utility as a general purpose programming language, that's a given. And it's certainly not easy to teach due to the uh, limitation or to the complexity of the language. And on top of that, since we require recompilation, what our engineers had to do in order to like be able to test it out end to end if this thing works was like synchronize the code over to like a virtual machine that would also run the downstream services, the APIs, and then have the ability like in graphical to try it really out end to end, right? And this whole process took three to six minutes, depending on whether or not you had compiled your dependencies already. And this is simply th something where we thought, no, that's not the way to go. We need to find a better way for our engineers to do that. So in actuality, we came up with a multi-stage plan. Let's have the Scala-based approach first, but then have a close look at what's, what was emerging, right? The emerging SEL spec, which was really exciting, and we eventually hoped that we could bet fully on that to allow an SDL-based approach to schema contribution. So compared to the Scala-based one, we wanted way faster feedback. So that should be a piece of the past three to six minutes. And it, we should be confident that for the 90% plus cases, 
it should be usable. We didn't want to end up in a situation where our engineers had to also learn STL and then Scala. So we wanted, for the majority of cases, to be able to just use that. Reasonable, uh, reasonably good performance, because Scala is fast, uh, and we didn't want to lose much here. It should be easy to teach, and it should leverage existing tooling that was around uh, the corners. At least it shouldn't break the assumptions of tools. So we didn't want to tap something on, tap something on that didn't make sense for, for tools that were kind of following the spec. So an SDL itself is a great starting point already. It's intuitive, it is versatile, it is way easier to learn than Scala, and it has first-class support for extensions. And we talked about directives, right? So on the one hand, you have multiple ways to define types, input types, output types, but also a first-class way to extend what the execution engine does, right? And this, for us, is really a good way to, to move, or was a good way to move forward. So this is a great package, but in order to get into the realm of 90%, we needed to look at our, our core use case, which is bind to RESTful APIs. So most of our fields are resolved using REST, and if we have to drop down to Scala to build the resolvers here, we wouldn't gain much. So our question was, can we build uh, resolvers purely in terms of STL, and can we make it feasible? Well, and you might, might think, yeah, I mean, easy enough. Let's take a directive and attach it to a field, right? So in this case, an HTTP GET directive, that when the field gets resolved, the execution engine knows, OK, we, okay go to that data uh, endpoint and just fetch the data, eventually completing the value. Um, while that sounds nice, what you see already that we use the same kind of data sources or the same kind of data at different places in the schema. It's a graph, after all. We have like, connections between nodes, and we have the same kind of data probably connected at different portions. So that would result in a lot of duplication of the how. How do I get the data, right, if I do it with directives? So while we thought the general way through directives sounds good, this particular way wasn't, wasn't it. So we wanted to eliminate the duplication that was necessary. And we are developers, right? So we thought about, OK, how do we enable reuse? We know how to do it. One way, at least, is to um, put it somewhere where, where we can reference it by some symbolic name, right? And the second thing is you have to account for some variability in the application of that thing, because usually it's not not exactly the same thing all the time. Um, OK, so this is basically what we had in mind. And we thought about the first problem, um, reference by name. And there didn't seem to be anything that we could use out of the box. And this was actually one of the MacGyver moments I talked about, where one of my colleagues came around and said, dudes, I have a wild idea. Let's take two types or two things that weren't supposed to be used that way, but let's do it anyways. Let's take input types, which give us a way to attach a name to something. And then let's take a directive, which gives us a way to describe the how. And then arrange the schema build process in such a way that we take those two components and generate a new directive out of it. So now we have like a, a, a naming to whatever we wanted to achieve. And we can, instead of duplicating the information about the how, just reference it here. Right? OK, that seemed to work out pretty well. In order to make this uh, feasibly work within our server implementation, we had to change a little bit. Let me quickly show you what we, what we updated here. So um, at the core, we have like the Scala-based schema, which sits kind of at the kernel. Uh, but then we also have a way to like, load STL sources from files or uploads or whatever. We merge that all together into a single AST, and then we do multiple passes over them, much like a compiler would do. Right? So one of those passes validates whatever we have against some meta schema. And the important step we have here is like, generate new directives out of these annotated input types. OK, so it did seem to go in the right direction. What was left, though, is parameterization. How do we do that? Well, that's actually the second reason why we picked input types, because usually they are not empty, right? They have fields. And we arranged the compilation process actually to also take into, into account those fields so that we compile the directive arguments out of it. And there is a one-to-one -one correspondence between the field names and the types and the arguments for the directives and their types. So this way, we got parameterization over our referenceable things. However, when we tried to apply it, there was one thing missing. So 
suppose you have uh, this type here where you want to query the Xing ID, and you somehow have to tell the execution engine, when we execute this query, give me the value of the ID argument here and make it available to whatever is like implemented with a directive here. So there's no way currently, at least not in, in the SDL spec itself, um, to, to make that happen. So in this time, we couldn't like recombine things. Uh, we rather had to come up with something on our own, but we made sure that we can embed it in what SDL provides, syntax-wise at least. Um, so we just call it expressions for the lack of a better name. Um, and it looks much like this, right? So um, expressions are essentially mini programs. So it's embedded source code in your schema definition. And when we build up the schema, we would not only uh, reify the schema itself, but also look at those expressions, right? And then we would give them a structure, partially evaluate them during schema build time to make it more efficient when we finally run the query, optimize them. And ultimately, though, those expressions will be executed during query execution time. There are a couple of features we, are currently, uh, we have currently implemented, which I want to briefly show you. So first is variable references, which is the most important thing we wanted to have. And it looks like this. You have like the person sign, the curly braces, and the name of a variable. And easy enough, it will, if the variable is bound, evaluate to that value. And there are multiple ways where you can use it. So you can, for example, transport the value of the ID field here over to the directive, or use it, as I uh, showed before, um, if you, do, if you attach the, like, the directive to a field of, an, of a type, of an output type. So in this example, uh, or one, one such variable that we provide is the query execution context, and we have also seen that already today, right? And this is not a scalar value, it's rather a complex value, which has a couple of other fields attached to it, the currently logged in user, uh, maybe access to some, some service objects. And in order to get at those, we need to implement like field selection. Yeah, it's Probably you know it, or it sounds familiar to you. It's uh, like most programming languages do, uh, do it these days. So it's just the name of the variable or the value to the left, then the dot, and then the name of the field. And naturally, you can like chain it and have uh, access to arbitrarily deep nested structures, right? And one example where we can use this is, for example, the arcs uh, object, which is attached to the context, which gives you which is itself is a complex object to all the named arguments of the fields you are about to resolve. Right? So you can refer to those arguments by name. A rather recent addition to, um, to, the, to these expressions is optional values. And in contrast to GraphQL, where the default is that fields are nullable, in the expression language it is flipped. So we assume that the variable is actually bound, it has a value. However, to play nicely in the GraphQL, uh, infrastructure in the GraphQL world, uh, we need to denote optionality. And we have been inspired by Swift here, so we can just attach a question mark, which basically says, it's OK if this variable is unbound or this variable um, resolves to null. And there are a couple of interesting use cases. For example, this one where we not only the, the params object there, the resulting uh, query parameters will not have the image size parameter in it. So we not only omit the value, make it empty or something, but we will not have, have the key in it. This is something we, we wanted, right? And this is an interesting interpretation in, in complex objects, uh, which came in handy. And there's probably more, right? So we feel that it is somehow the Swiss army knife for us today uh, to address the use cases that pop up. And there are new use cases that we wanted to address. Um, and we somehow wanted to make sure that the concept itself makes sense, doesn't break the assumption of tools, and could be built on. Um, so types, extensive use of directives, and expressions for us really unlocked all the flexibility that we seeked so that our developers could actually use this nice, or could actually experience uh, this nice approach. And just to give you a brief example of what this actually looks like, this is a, a recent real-world file that is used by some of our product teams to integrate, in this case, the new section of our platform uh, with a more complicated uh, directive, which is capable of pulling out uh, polymorphic results from different endpoints. But, um, okay, but 
how did, how did we fare with regards to what we wanted to achieve? Remember that three to six minutes, we're down to four seconds. So compared to that, this is huge. So we just have to sync like the files over, the service builds the schema newly, and then we can, we can access it, right? And you have like tied in your REST API. And the coolest thing about this, about this is our front-end people do this. We get pull requests from front-end people that just bind to the REST APIs that exist. This is awesome. Performance-wise, we lost quite a bit. 7% um, over the native implementation. We didn't optimize much with regards to execution time because uh, we are still very snappy. So um, most of the time is spent anywhere in network calls. So this is not a major concern right now, but maybe we will address it. The new products that we have been onboarding since then showed that we could implement all of the use cases purely in terms of STL. So this seems to be a good way to move forward within the context of our company. And the feedback we got from our product teams is that it's easy to grasp. So we have a workshop of five hours where, get, where they get a firehose introduction into GraphQL basics, SDL, and our additions to them. And they are capable of binding to the REST APIs within those five hours. And it's hugely satisfying for our engineers. Actually, all success factors have been met for us. And we are very happy about it. Uh, our engineers are very happy about it, and we are happy that they are happy, right? <laughs> um, however, it cannot be everything great, right? There must be problems, obviously. There is no free lunch. And there are a couple of things which I want to talk about. So the implementation is rather complex. Compared to the Scala-based one, this is actually quite complex. But we are happy to push that into a component where a few people have to deal with it, rather than having to roll out a more complex approach to the rest of the company. Uh, so we're actually happy with the trade-off here. Expressions could and did introduce attack vectors. So like if you evaluate data that can com come from the outside, for example, in a path, in a URI path, you might end up with URI injection vulnerabilities. And we, in, in fact, had that, and we had to mitigate that. Um, we are very, very about that, and we, we look into what is possible here. So. Um, Obviously, there, there must be problems. Then the creative abuse of the features that SDL provides is probably a problem. I'm really curious. You tell me afterwards. Please approach me. I'm going to run around, and uh, I'm really happy to hear what you, what you think. Uh, and tell me we are crazy or this wouldn't, wouldn't work. I'm happy to learn what you think about this. And there is probably more. I, I don't know. We, we will see in the future. But the one thing that, that I took from this journey is that uh, it is very exciting what is currently happening in the community, and especially around STL. And I think it is a promising way forward. And um, I think it is worthwhile sometimes to look at the tools you have at your hand, that maybe squint a little bit, uh, like push one thing like a little bit, it maybe falls over, but then it fits somehow. Uh, and then if you really have to solve a tricky problem, Maybe it's sometimes worth asking yourself, what would MacGyver do in this situation, right? And uh, actually, I'm closing way too early, but I'm, that's all I have to say. Thanks so much.